everybody here submitted their pr proposal except for one group. Okay, that group is also going to submit. Okay. Uh, hopefully, we'll get started on multi-threading today. I'm, I intend to cover multi-threading in the next two lectures, but we'll finish up asymmetry first. Is anybody working on multi-threading for their project? No, not quite. That's an exciting topic also. But you can ask which topic is not exciting. <laughs> okay, we've already covered this. And you all remember the review assignments that are due Sunday, not Friday. So you have a lot of time to read these interesting papers, hopefully. Last lecture, we covered bottleneck identification and scheduling, or if you've finished it, and we talked about stage execution. Those are also very important research areas, especially making, uh, making multi-core architectures much better at executing fine-grained tasks is a very important research area. And one of the issues in those fine-grained tasks is what are the bottlenecks? Uh, and one of the bottlenecks is, well, we've covered several of the synchronization bottlenecks. And when you divide a big, a big problem into very fine-grained tasks, and we're talking about tens or hundreds of instructions in a task, then communication becomes a problem, and stage execution targets that problem. Uh, we'll talk about some architectures that are actually designed to execute some of those fine-grained tasks today, some of the early multi-threading architectures. Uh, one of the papers you read about the heterogeneous element processor was actually designed to execute very fine-grained tasks, and we'll talk about that. You remember the synchronization primitives, for example, across those tasks, right? The full empty bits. Yes, the, uh, the Burton Smith paper that you read from 1981, it talked about that, right? Yes, at least one person says yes. So <laughs> at least one person read that part of the paper. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, so today we'll uh, look into other examples of asymmetry uh, in memory scheduling. And we'll wrap up asymmetry, and then we'll jump into multi-threading. Oh, and I keep pressing the wrong button. Or maybe there's some interference between these buttons somehow. That could be true also. OK, just to, just to remind you what data marshaling was, you can look at it again. And I think that one of the key things in all of this research uh, going forward is how to enable very fine-grained remote execution, because once you design accelerators or asymmetric uh, multi-core chips, you need to ship some computation somewhere. And how do you enable that is a, a big problem. And data marshaling is one way of doing that. OK, a totally different topic in asymmetry, uh, thread cluster memory scheduling. You guys uh, have taken my classes, so you know what uh, memory scheduling issues there are. I won't, I'm not going to remind you again what exactly those are. But basically, memory is a shared resource. And you may have multiple cores or multiple threads in a multi-threaded machine contending for this memory. Right? And when these cores generate requests that need to access memory, there needs to be an arbiter there. And that arbiter is the memory controller, right? If that arbiter is not doing that job well, uh, you, get, you can get significant degradation in single thread performance. Well, you will get degradation in single thread performance if you're running together with other threads, right? Because at some point, another thread will request uh, the memory bus. And one other thread that has a request would get delayed. There, there's no question about that. That has to happen. But the question is, how do you manage that contention? If you don't manage it well, as you've seen in 447 and 740, one core may deny service to another core, right? Remember, we, existing memory schedulers have policies to prioritize row buffer hits over row buffer misses. You've had good exam questions in both 447 and 740 related to this. Uh, if you have that scheduler, a thread that has very good row buffer locality can be prioritized by that scheduler for a long time until it stops generating requests to that particular row that's already open in the bank. And another thread that's executing some other core may be just waiting, doing nothing. Right? And that thread may be the one, actually, you would like to prioritize if you want to improve system throughput. Uh, 
because that thread may have only one request outstanding. And if that request would get serviced, that thread would go back and compute and not generate any more requests. But if you delay that request, that thread would be stalling in its core. Right? And that degrades system performance significantly. And if you starve the wrong thread, not only that thread's performance degrades, but also system performance degrades because the core will be twiddling its thumbs, waiting, right? So one key question is how do you schedule memory requests to increase both system throughput and fairness? And in both 447 and 740, you've seen different mechanisms. If you remember, we talked about stall time fair memory scheduling, right? How many people remember that? Zero? <laughs> yeah, there you go, one. <laughs> One brave person. <laughs> we talk about parallelism or batch scheduling, right? We talk about these approaches. Uh, and if you, if you do not remember, you can go back and look at the lecture notes. They're all in the lecture notes and the exam also. <laughs> so uh, those new scheduling mechanisms try to answer this question, right? They try to improve both system throughput and fairness somehow. Today, I'll describe a different scheduling mechanism I don't think I've talked about this in 447 or 740, maybe in 740, but it's been, a, it's been more than a year. So even I don't remember if I talked about it. <laughs> but hopefully you do remember if you learned about it. <laughs> uh, many of the scheduling algorithms that we, we've discussed are actually biased in one way uh, or another. If you look at this graph, uh, this graph on the x-axis shows weighted speed up, and hopefully you remember what weighted speed up is. Uh, we will get back to this when we talk about multi-threading a little bit. Uh, but it's a measure of system throughput, multi -th uh, system throughput when you're running multi-programmed applications. By the way, this is another research topic. How do you measure system throughput when you're running multiple programs uh, and that consist of multiple threads, potentially? Uh, it's an interesting topic because it's not clear if this is the best metric. But let's assume that this correlates well with system throughput. Uh, you get better system throughput as you go to the right. And y-axis is another metric that you're familiar with, hopefully. This is the maximum slowdown of any application that's running on the multi-core system. And if it's high, that means that applications, one, at least one application slowed down a lot compared to when it's running alone. So this is a metric of fairness, right? If this is low, it's better, right? If it's one, it's great. No application slows down. But that probably is not possible if, there's no, if there is resource sharing, right? Unless applications are actually using the resource in totally disparate times. But that usually doesn't happen if the resource is uh, contended. OK, so, so lower is better, of course. Lower slowdown is better. And you cannot do better than one. Or can you do better than one? This could be a nice question also. <laughs> That's right, exactly. So if, if, when you're running alone, you may get misses uh, in, uh, in your cache, or you may get robo for misses in memory, because you need to open the rows and bring the data into your cache. But when you're running together with two, with another thread, that happens to be accessing the same memory location, same pages, let's say. If that thread brings in the pages earlier, this other thread would speed up, right, compared to when it's run alone. So that's one case where you can get slowdown that's less than one. But for these applications, that doesn't happen. <laughs> these are, this data will be averaged over hundreds or so applications on a 24-core system uh, for memory control, with four memory controllers. So ideally, you would like to go somewhere here, right? High system throughput and low maximum slowdown, high fairness. If you look at one of the schedulers, Atlas, if you remember, we did not cover this in detail, but here the idea is prioritize a thread that has attained the least service from the memory scheduler. The memory controller looks at threads, figures out how much service it has given to each thread, and service means when, it, when you uh, schedule a request of a thread, you increment the attained service counter for that thread. And the thread that has the least attained service is ranked higher over th other threads. And the intuition is that that thread has been 
delayed. And that thread uh, doesn't need a lot of uh, memory service. Because if a thread has gi been given a lot of service, that means it's more memory intensive also. And it's probably not delayed because it's been given a lot of service. Right? So that's the idea. In fact, operating systems have been designed uh, to do this kind of scheduling also to ensure that threads uh, that do not require a lot of service uh, get, uh, get prioritized. That's essentially what this mechanism does. As a result, this has system throughput bias, right? Threads that do not require a lot of service get prioritized. But threads that have used a lot of service, uh, they star for a while, especially if you have lots of threads. We will see this uh, in a little bit more detail soon. This you're, you're familiar with parallelism over batch scheduling. Uh, the idea here was uh, to preserve the parallelism of each thread across banks, right? To be able to do that, you rank the threads. And within that ranking, the threads that are less intensive, if you will, it's not exactly that way, but threads that are less intensive are prioritized over others. But then you have this batching mechanism. The controller forms batches of requests and enforces this ranking within the batch. And the batch is prior, uh, once uh, the oldest batch is always prioritized over any other batch, any other request, right? So this batching ensures that you're fair you keep moving, right? But this batching also makes sure that this has a fairness bias. Because before a batch is complete, you cannot service any request from any other thread. Even though that thread may have a request outside the batch, and that may be the only request, right? If you service that request, that thread can keep its core busy. That's why you lose throughput. Because this enforces that batch. It's not aware of that thread's single request. So this has a fairness bias. So you, you can already see that none of them achieves the best throughput and fairness. And this is stall time fair memory scheduling. You know about this. The idea here is to uh, balance the slowdowns of threads that are sharing the memory controller, where memory controller computes the slowdown of each thread. And it was a complex mechanism, if you remember, uh, compared to when it's run alone. And prioritizes the thread that has been slowed down the most. So that tries to achieve some sort of fairness. But it doesn't uh, get good performance uh, because it doesn't have the parallelism awareness, right? It doesn't do ranking, for example, across threads. Ranking enables this parallelism awareness uh, across different banks. And this is the first ready, first come, first serve scheduler, which is the row hit first scheduler uh, that is implemented in many processors today, a variant of which is implemented in many different processors, or memory, many different memory controllers, I should say, today. So it's no good for anything, if you, as you see. So these are not uh, in the Pareto optimal front, uh, if you want to think of it that way. They're not good for either fairness or system throughput. Whereas these two schedulers are good for either fairness or throughput, but they're biased one way or the other. right? So I guess the takeaway is no memory scheduling algorithm, at least these, uh, provides the best fairness and system throughput. You have two metrics you're trying to optimize for. How do you get the best of both worlds? Well, you've listened to my lectures, right? The answer will be asymmetry, again. When you, when you have multiple metrics to optimize, and you cannot optimize it with a single policy, maybe you should be designing multiple different policies to cater differently to different metrics. Yes? So these are implemented in the memory controller? That's right, yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, what, uh, so when you send memory request, does the, does the processor going to also send the process information with it on the bus? You mean you're talking about previously? Oh. Like when the memory controller was off chip? Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I thought that uh, memory controller can't have a knowledge about the, what process is running it. So there, there is no can't. <laughs> you're the architect, right? You're the computer architect. Just because it's not done today doesn't mean that it cannot be done, right? Can't is very strong. <laughs> but uh, yes, you have a point. Uh, previously, when the memory control was sitting outside uh, the chip, you may not want to send the thread ID or the core ID uh, with the request. Why? Security may be less of a concern. There is a more fundamental concern, right? What, what does that require? What does that core ID require? Bandwidth. 
And what does that mean pins. physically? Oh. There you go, pins, right, <laughs> extra pins. So that's, that's a very valuable resource. If you actually have pins to uh, encode the core ID along with the request, now that, that would consume power and more, more than power, it's cost, right? That's why it wasn't done okay. at that time. And also it wasn't as big a problem as you might imagine, right? Because there, you, there would be fewer cores sharing the memory controller in that case. Right now we can put many cores on chip and they would be sharing the memory controller. But now memory controller is on chip, so you can easily communicate that core ID. Okay. That doesn't mean that it's done again <laughs> today. In fact, in many systems it's not done yet. It's, it's getting there. People are actually adding uh, the thread IDs or core IDs and they're propagating them down into the memory controller. Uh, there are practical reasons why that's, that's going slowly because there are, other, there are different groups working on this in companies, right? Traditionally, companies have core groups, cache groups, memory controller groups, and they don't communicate with each other. And that's a problem. <laughs> but that's, it's becoming uh, much more integrated. So you're right. It, it wasn't done, but it's being done right now. So these are simulation? These are all simulation results, that's right, yes. It's hard to, it's very hard to get these results on real systems. Yes? So when we're talking about the fairness, shouldn't we consider uh, like difference between maximum and minimum slowdown? So just maximum slowdown and... Mm -hmm. So that's a good question. <laughs> we can talk about this metric for years probably and never <laughs> go into that. But yeah, so when we started doing this research, that was our metric. Fairness is max slowdown in the system divided by minimum slowdown in the system. But that metric has some downsides, right? So if, uh, for example, if, which one is better? If you, you have two threads that, that both slow down by 4x. In that case, that metric gives you a fairness of one, which is great, or unfairness of one. Uh, but then uh, you can have a system that has for each, for both of those threads, a slowdown of two versus four. The second system is strictly better, right, in terms of <laughs> performance. And uh, you could argue that fairness also, because none of them is slowed down by more than four. Or two, uh, two and three, think about it that way. One system uh, where the slowdowns are four and four, and another system where the slowdowns of the same threads are two and three. If you look at fairness, the second one would tell you that it's not fair but is it really not fair? <laughs> You're improving the performance of both. <laughs> so you could argue the other way also. You could, uh, you could say that's, that's still not strictly fair because you're treating one over the, you're slowing down one more than the other. But that doesn't take into account performance at all. So in a sense, this takes into account performance a little bit more than the other fairness metric. But I can, I can, see, that, I can see this argument going forever. This has gone on forever in many other domains also. Fairness is a very hard metric to argue. <laughs> but that's my intuitive argument for this metric. <laughs> okay. Okay, let's get back. Why do these previous algorithms fail? Maybe fail is a strong word, but if you think about it, there are two approaches. Throughput biased approach says prioritize less memory intensive threads. That's the Atlas-like approach. Uh, basically, rank the threads in terms of their memory intensity and give more higher priority to less memory intensive threads. This is good for thread A, right? Because that gets prioritized and it keeps its core busy. And it has the most potential for it keeping its core busy because it's not generating a lot of requests. But this is bad for thread C because it gets stuck behind many other threads. It's, it has the least priority right, in the memory scheduler. And it starves for a while, at least on fairness. On the other hand, fairness biased approach, a simple way of thinking about it, uh, says give each thread its turn to access memory once in a while. Right. It's the round robin across the threads. In this case, uh, and maybe you can have some t time slice during which you prioritize that thread. Not, not only one request, but many requests. Yes. That, also, 
So I wasn't thinking about that. I was thinking about how many requests, the request rate okay. of a thread. Right. But you could potentially define a memory intensity metric that's more elaborate than that. Yeah. So fairness bias approach says take turns, do round robin. This is good for thread C because it doesn't star, right? Uh, it can get its turn and get, its, get the bandwidth it needs from memory. But this is bad for a thread A, but now it, it becomes delayed. It needs to wait. That single request that it is generating needs to wait until thread A gets its turn. And it may be a while if you have 100 threads. Right? And we'll see machines soon that have 100 hundreds of threads. Or you read about one machine. How many threads does it have? have, have? Heterogeneous element processor? 50. 50 user threads. Right? I thought there were 70 OS threads. But that's a good start, 50. <laughs> and we'll see some machines that have even more threads. But anyway, I'm diverging. Uh, so the point is this is not prioritized, so you don't get the high throughput that you get here. But you're more fair, hopefully. The takeaway is if you use a single policy, it's not sufficient to optimize for both metrics. So why not have a policy that's asymmetric? Why not have multiple policies to cater for the needs for different threats? And that's the idea, to achieve best of both worlds, fairness and throughput at the same time. Uh, well, let's start with throughput. For throughput, we would like to prioritize memory non-intensive threats. Right? And these are the threats that are memory non-intensive. It's higher priority. For fairness, we realize that unfairness is caused by these memory intensive threads being prioritized over each other. If you consistently prioritize one of the intensive threads over another, the another thread, that the one that's deprioritized, starts for a while. That leads to unfairness. But if you prioritize these little ones over these big ones, that doesn't impact fairness that much. Because these have few requests. Think about only a single request, for example. Only a single request doesn't delay the hundreds of requests of these threads that much. So the idea is to shuffle the priority of these threads, just like the fairness biased approach. But do it just for these threads. Because these are threads that get impacted if you prioritize uh, one of them over the other for a long time. And if you read the paper, you'll see that there is, well, you already know that threads have different vulnerability to interference because of robot for locality and bank level parallelism. You can do this shuffling asymmetrically. You can give a little bit more turn, uh, a few more turns to a thread that is more vulnerable. Right. I'm not going to cover that, but you can read the paper for that. I haven't assigned this paper, but uh, we'll assign it perhaps when we talk about the memory system. So it's a good idea to prefetch your readings. <laughs> OK. <laughs> I guess you, you, you'll argue that prefetching doesn't help if you're bandwidth constrained, right? If, you're, if, you're, if you don't have bandwidth to <laughs> prefetch, then you cannot prefetch. <laughs> so real life is the same as computer architecture. Right? You can empathize with a memory controller that's prefetching. <laughs> OK, so you can shuffle asymmetrically. So that's the idea, basically. For throughput, we'd like to do this. For fairness, we'd like to do this. And to be able to do this, basically, now we have two different policies. right? We've grouped the threads into two different things. That's the idea of thread cluster memory scheduling. We'd like to group threads into two clusters, memory non-intensive, memory intensive, and prioritize the non-intensive cluster over the other one to improve throughput. And this doesn't impact fairness as much. And use different policies in each cluster. In the non-intensive cluster, you'd like to optimize for throughput again. And here, you can now rank threads based on intensity and prioritize the less intensive threads because they have more potential to make progress. In this cluster, the policy is even more important because you don't want to starve any thread. You want to give enough bandwidth to each thread that, because these threads require a lot of bandwidth. They're memory intensive. So you use the policy to shuffle the ranking of the threads. Make sense? OK, this is exactly what I said before. An intensive cluster, basically, you periodically shuffle the priority of the threads or priority ordering of the threads. OK, and you can read the paper to figure out 
is treating all threads in this cluster good enough? It may not be, right? because you can think of a streaming thread versus a random access thread. One of them has a lot more vulnerability to interference, the random access thread. Right? OK. So if you do this, if you have this asymmetric policy, so the end result is an asymmetric policy, right? You, don't have, you have two policies, actually. Two different policies apply to different threads, different thread groups. Uh, I'll go over the results again. These are the four previous schedulers. And thread cluster memory scheduling sits here. So you can optimize for both thro throughput and fairness at the same time. And these are more quantitative numbers. So it, increase, it, it provides the best fairness and system throughput. And usually when you try to get the best of multiple worlds, asymmetry is a good uh, tool to achieve that. The key question is how do you architect the asymmetry? Okay, there's another benefit to this, it turns out. If you vary the configuration parameter uh, of each of the memory scheduling policy, you get a curve between, uh, that varies the throughput and fairness. For example, with first ready, first come, first serve, it's a row hit first scheduling policy. You can have a parameter that says, uh, that limits the reordering that happens uh, above the oldest request. Right? In first ready, first come, first serve, uh, you can limit the number of row hit requests that bypass, that are serviced before the oldest request. In the purest form of the policy, there is no limit. In, if, if that limit is zero, which means no row hit request can bypass the oldest request, and that's the only way of bypassing the oldest request, that degenerates into first come, first serve. And if your limit is in between, then you limit that reordering. And if you change that parameter, let's call it a cap of reordering, this is what the policy behaves like. It looks like a weird curve, right? It's not clear uh, how you get from one place to other. Stall time fair memory scheduling, if you remember, has another parameter, the unfairness threshold. When do you uh, decide to prioritize requests from the thread that has been slowed down the most? If unfairness is greater than some fraction then that's the decision. And if you vary that fraction, you get a weird curve like this again. PowerBS, parallelism or batch scheduling has another parameter, right? If you remember how many uh, requests are marked from a thread to be in the batch. How do you form the batch, basically? Again, if you vary that parameter, you get a weird curve like this. In Atlas, there is another parameter. And if you vary that, you get this curve. In thread cluster memory scheduling, there's another parameter which is the cluster threshold. Where do you decide, uh, how do you decide what thread belongs to the non-intensive cluster and what thread belongs to the intensive cluster? And you can read the paper for details. But if you vary that within reasonable, uh, uh, within reasonable values, you'll get a curve like this. So it, it gives you a smooth trade-off between throughput and fairness. Okay, so summary. Uh, previous memory scheduling algorithms cannot provide both high system throughput and fairness at the same time because they use a single policy for all threads, even though threads requirements are different. TCM is a heterogeneous scheduling policy or asymmetric scheduling policy that does these, and hopefully you'll remember that. And this asymmetry in memory scheduling provides the best through throughput and fairness at the same time. So you could imagine other ways in providing this. This problem actually is similar to what, you ca what, what has been done in operating systems. Right? If you've taken operating systems courses, the, an operating system schedule has the same problem. You have a pool of threads, and you would like to optimize system throughput. You're going to schedule threads onto the course. You'd like to optimize for system throughput, uh, and you'd like to also not starve threads unreasonably. That's fairness. Right? And operating system schedulers have employed kind of similar policies. If you look at the Linux scheduler, sometimes they call this non-intensive threads as latency-sensitive threads. Now, there is other information in the operating system that you can use, right, which is the interactivity. Is the thread actually launched by some user action? Now, that becomes latency-sensitive or interactive. But usually, non-intensive threads, let's assume that that's out of the picture. Non-intensive threads that execute for a short time are considered by latent sensitive threads and by operating systems and they're prioritized. 
other threats, long-running threats, which could be considered intensive in terms of the CPU requirements they have, how long they need to run on the CPU, are uh, prioritized using a similar policy. They're, they're the operating systems round robin across those threats. If you look at the multi-level scheduler uh, in Windows NT, I guess Windows in general, I guess I'm, I'm old, old <laughs> uh, my knowledge is old, Windows NT doesn't exist anymore, right? <laughs> Does it? Yeah, but I read the Windows NT scheduler, <laughs> uh, not the code, but uh, there, there, uh, there are good books actually on Windows scheduling, you can take a look at that. <laughs> But if you look at that book, that tells you uh, how that scheduler operates. And the principles are similar. If a thread is short running, it's prioritized. If a thread has been running long, uh, among all of those long running threads, the operating system scheduler round robins. OK, so if you want to uh, read more about the memory scheduler, this will be assigned at some point, probably. <laughs> So you can do your prefetching. <laughs> okay. I do I want to cover this? Maybe I'll skip some of these. I'll leave this to you. This is the paper you're going to read, so I'm not going to cover that. But the, I'll give you the basic idea. Well, I guess I've given you the basic idea earlier. Mm. This previous memory scheduling uh, algorithm that I described is, uh, works for threads that are independent. What if you have dependencies across threads, like we've discussed in bottleneck identification and scheduling, right? You have synchronization points. Then you may want to prioritize, identify, and prioritize the thread that is limiting the performance, or the bottleneck thread, or the critical thread. That's the idea in the paper that you're going to read. And I'll leave you just with that. But then what do you do with the other threads in that application? So if you know the critical thread, you probably want to prioritize the request coming from that thread in the memory scheduler. How do you identify the critical thread? You could identify it using the mechanisms that we discussed for bottleneck identification and scheduling. Right? And this paper describes similar mechanisms. So let's say you prioritize that thread, but what do you do with the non-critical threads? The memory scheduler's goal perhaps should be to ensure that those threads don't become critical. Right? And uh, the scheduler that's described shuffles the priorities among these non-critical threads, and there are particular mechanisms to do that. So this is definitely a, uh, an important topic. Uh, in fact, the next step is uh, figuring out how to do the memory scheduling when you have multiple multi-threaded applications. Right? In general, how do you do the resource management in the cache, in the memory system, in the interconnect, when you have multiple multi-threaded applications with different critical threads is an important problem. And that has, that's a tough problem. Not many people have tackled it yet, but that needs to be tackled. Principles may still be the same, but it's not clear how you do it, right? Some principles may be the same. Because there are may, many resource allocation decisions, right? Let's say you have a critical thread in one application versus a non-critical thread in another application. Do you really prioritize this critical thread? Maybe this other thread is still reasonably critical. Right. So it's not exactly clear what, what you would do. OK, and then there is also uh, the thing that I did not talk about, but I'll go back to, I guess. How do you do this when you have asymmetric cores? It's not only, uh, your cores are not symmetric, your cores may have different requirements too, right? And this paper talks about that, but I'll not cover that right now. Maybe when we get to memory systems. Although we have gotten to memory systems, I has given you a lecture on this, so I'm not gonna cover this in detail. The idea here was, if you remember, uh, we, we can have multiple technologies in main memory uh, and we may want to employ those technologies to get the benefits of both, or to enable the benefits of both. Right. For example, you can have uh, DRAM technology that has these characteristics. It's fast, durable, but it's high cost. And because it's high cost, uh, 
you don't want to make it big. And again, it's leaky. That may be another reason why you don't want to make it big. And it's volatile. So you have a small amount of DRAM augmented by perhaps phase change memory or some technology X that is large, provides high capacity, that is low cost because it's more scalable in terms of technology. If you remember Hans' lecture, uh, some other technologies are more scalable than DRAM because they're not based on storage of charge. They're, they're, uh, the fundamental mechanism in which they encode a one or zero is very different from whether charge exists or doesn't exist, or how much charge exists or doesn't exist. Charge control and placement is difficult. That's one of the fundamental reasons why DRAM and flash memories are not easily scalable. Because as you scale down the size, the charge becomes small. Right? Whereas if you encode data in terms of resistance, that's more scalable because now you're not controlling charge. You're controlling something easier to control. OK, so that could, that's why this could be scalable as a result, low cost. And it's also non-volatile. But the pro it has problems also. It's slow. Right? And it wears out. And it has high active energy. And hopefully you remember why it has high active energy. Right? OK, good. You need to change the phase right, to <laughs> go between states <laughs> or detect the resistance. <laughs> OK, so if you have this kind of system, heterogeneous memory system, then the question is, how do you take advantage of it right? to maximize different metrics? You want to maximize performance, but you don't want your memory to wear out also. Right? Mm. And Han has given you some uh, techniques or ideas uh, in which hard how hardware and software can manage data allocation and movement between these memories to achieve the best of these technologies. Right? That's another way of exploiting asymmetry in the memory system. I think Han has already talked about this, right? Using DRAM as a cache for a phase change memory. So I'm going to skip this. You can read it again. And these are things Han has talked about. So yes? In this arrangement, we, uh, the hardware managed everything and it was kept like, hidden from the software. Mm -hmm. That's right. You could, you could manage it in software. That's, that's true. But you may not get the fine-grained benefits if you manage it in software, right? Because the, the latencies uh, of these two memories are still relatively close. It's not like uh, this is DRAM and this is disk. It's not orders of magnitude difference. This is 2x to 10x different. Right? So if you want to transfer a page from one to the other, that has a lot of overhead in software whereas it has less overhead in hardware. So you could certainly manage in software, purely in software, but that may not be able to achieve uh, the best possible benefits you can achieve from this hardware substrate. But maybe, uh, maybe it's a combination of both in the end. Maybe you would like to manage partly in hardware and partly in software. Software can provide hints as to what should be allocated where based on programmer input or some other input. And hardware can use those hints to, in addition to the dynamic information about the pages or blocks, uh, to uh, decide where to allocate the data. So there are benefits to both. And that's usually the best way of managing systems in general, a combination of hardware and software. Because you have information coming from the software that cannot be at least easily figured out by the hardware. And some things cannot be at all figured out by hardware. Right? Like how important is this to the user? If you solve that problem purely in hardware, you would make a big contribution. But that's, that may be difficult. <laughs> Predicting the intent of the user at that very low level is very difficult. So that was purely in hardware, right? I'm not missing. Uh, what, we, what Han had discussed? Yes, that's purely hardware. So this, this 
what I described over here is purely hardware, right? Memory controller manages, hardware manages the DRAM cache. Right? So DRAM is not visible to the software in that case. Okay, so I'll leave this because you already covered this in detail, unless you have questions. You had a question. Okay, so we've covered many different forms of asymmetry in the last, was it three lectures, three and a half lectures? So let me summarize all of this. Uh, basically, if you look at applications and phases, you have varying performance requirements. Right? And if you, you, we have designs that are evaluated on multiple metrics or constraints, energy, performance, reliability, fairness, lifetime, you can add more to it. If you have one size fits all resources, this cannot satisfy all of the requirements and metrics. Basically, you cannot get the best of both worlds. You cannot have a resource that's great in all metrics for all applications for all phases. It's kind of obvious after all of this. But asymmetry enables the trade-offs to be able to achieve the best of all worlds. If you're doing the management well, you can hopefully at least approximate the benefit of uh, well, you can at least approximate the best of all worlds. And I've given you some examples. One is if you have asymmetry in core microarchitecture, large cores versus small cores, you can get good parallel performance plus good serialized performance. Right. That was what accelerated critical sections, bottleneck identification and scheduling, and data marshalling, which is supporting both, was about. If you have asymmetry in memory scheduling, you can get good throughput and good fairness at the same time. And if you have asymmetry in main memory, Han talked about this more, you can get good performance and good efficiency and maybe other metrics also. So, and maybe you're gonna populate this more <laughs> as you <laughs> design systems or research systems going into the future. I think the takeaway is this, these are simple or relatively simple asymmetric designs. And these could be effective and low cost. The question is, can you actually make it even more general? Make sense? Well, I'd encourage you to think more about what can be done with this, with asymmetry. It really depends on what kind of asymmetry do you architect and how do you exploit it? This may be a good time to break for five minutes or seven minutes when we come back at 525 and start multi-threading. But this is when we uh, got to multi-threading, I guess. This is an exciting topic. And I always like talking about multi-threading. Hopefully, you'll be as excited as I am on this. But before we start, me, I don't know if you're excited about this part. <laughs> These, this is a very incomplete list. You've already read four papers, but these are not going to be required for review, but you would benefit from reading. Well, I guess one of them was. So you lucked out on this one. <laughs> the others are uh, readings. Some, some of them I will talk about, some of them I will not, but you will benefit from these readings if you read them. I'm sorry? These are not for review. Not for review, yeah, these are not going to be for review. You have other papers that you're gonna review. And these are recommended papers Again, some of which, well, one of which you read an extended version of. So when you have time, I would recommend you to read these papers. And I will in particular talk about this first paper because this is a good example of how not to write papers. <laughs> how you can have a great idea and not have any effect. Oh, that's another way of putting it. These people have a, had a great idea, simultaneous multi-threading. As you can imagine from the title, an elementary processor architecture with simultaneous instruction issuing from multiple threads. That's essentially simultaneous multi-threading. And if you look at it, it's published in ISCA 1992. Whereas the first paper that's really credited for simultaneous multi-threading is published in ISCA 1995. And there's a reason why this paper had almost zero effect, even though it had that great idea that many companies are still implementing but it had zero effect because it was not written in a way where people would understand what the idea is and why it's important. Yes? So 
what about this paper yeah. that made it and have no effect yeah. because it was not written well. <laughs> I can say it in five words. <laughs> not written well, three words. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the importance of uh, communicating your ideas uh, in a way many people can understand. So I would encourage you to read this paper. I'm not going to require it, but we'll get to it in a little bit. Uh, it's, it has that idea. It has that simultaneous multi-threading idea, but it's never credited for it. OK. Actually, there's another paper also that had the idea. And we'll also talk about it briefly. <laughs> but that was later. That was in 1994. Okay. Anyway, we'll get to that again. <laughs> so this is kind of an outline of what we'll talk about. This will probably cover more than two lectures now. Uh, we'll talk about multiple hardware contexts, which is what multi-threading is. We'll talk about its purpose, some initial incarnations. We'll talk about levels or granularity of multi-threading. And hopefully you're familiar with this by now, but we'll go into more detail in each. And we'll talk about uh, its traditional uses, plus more creative uses that you've read about, right? Helper threading, for example, or subordinate micro-threading, or using multi-threading hardware to do redundant execution, right? You've read about those, hopefully. Those are interesting uses. Basically, now that we have multiple contexts, what do we do with it? Other than executing multiple threads that, are, that happen to be dependent or independent or that happen to exist. How can we create new threads? Right. And we will hopefully transition into speculative multi-threading from here, which is the idea of using multi-threading hardware to improve single thread performance by speculatively parallelizing the program. And hopefully there will be very interesting readings over there too. Unfortunately, no processor exists that does that today because it's a hard problem. It's difficult to uh, build hardware that satisfies all of those requirements to ensure that program executes correctly. Okay, so some basics. What is a thread? We had this discussion briefly last time because one of you asked. Basically, it's a, a thread is an instruction stream with state. Right? Registers and memory consist of the state. Register state is also called the thread context. Uh, Threads could be part of the same process, program, or from different programs. Threads in the same program share the same address space in the shared memory model. Right. Traditionally, uh, the processor keep, has kept track of the context of a single thread. Right. That's been many of our discussions uh, in 447. Right? When you designed your processor, it was single thread executing. Uh, on actually in all the labs, right? In all of the seven labs. Well, I guess the seventh lab was coherent, so you had more, th more than one thread in that case. Uh, but, but in that case, even in the, the single processor was executing single thread, right? We did not have a multi-threaded processor. Maybe we should add an eighth lab to that course with multi-threading. What do you think? <laughs> then, <laughs> then you would learn about multi-threading very well. Okay. So uh, I'm joking. Uh, <laughs> so traditionally, you have single threads. But in software, you have many threads, right, that uh, may need to be executed. So uh, systems have used multitasking. And I will distinguish this from multi-threading. Multitasking, when you need to execute a new thread, you take out the old thread's context from the hardware, write it somewhere into memory, and load the context of the new thread. That's multitasking. You have different software threads that are brought in and brought out of the thread context, single thread context in hardware. We'll still have that. But that's the difference between the multi-threading that we will talk about and multitask uh, multitasking. In multitasking, you have software loading and unloading thread context into the hardware, th uh, hardware supported thread context. OK? Whereas multi-threading is, in hardware multi-threading is, have multiple thread contexts in a single processor. Right. So you can actually execute those different threads at the same time. Uh, and the granularity of multi-threading, which we will get into, fine grain 
coarse grain and uh, simultaneous uh, depends on when the hardware executes from those hardware contexts, thread contexts. Do you do it every other cycle? Do you do it, do you switch between these hardware contexts at coarse grain intervals? Or do you, do, it, do you simultaneously execute from these hardware thread contexts in the same cycle? OK, well, before getting into the granularity, why do we want multi-threading? Like, what is the benefit of it? It's a better usage of resources. That's right. You can utilize your resources better. If some of your resources are idle, let's say you have four functional units, or maybe you have some pipeline stages that are idle because you have dependencies in a program, if you could execute or send instructions that can utilize those pipeline stages, you get better use of resources, right? You increase resource utilization. What else? Yes? You want to time share a large system amongst a bunch of people where it seems like they're all using just one system? OK. I guess you improve throughput, right? That's what you're saying. Yeah, you can improve throughput. And that's another reason. By, sh by better utilizing resources. These, are, these go hand in hand. Because you have these idle resources, you can utilize them better, and you can improve throughput while doing so. What else? Actually, my first bullet is something else, I think. Uh, yeah. Hide the memory latency. That's right, yes. You can hide latency light, latency tolerance. And that was the initial, yeah, you have one more. No, wow, is it going to fit? <laughs> yeah. Isn't hiding memory latency the same thing as increasing system throughput? You're doing something else while you're waiting on memory. That's right. I guess you can think of, these are all different sides of the same coin, perhaps, saying the same thing. But uh, yeah, it, it is, because I motivated the other one as dependent instructions, right? Dependent instructions lead to resource underuse. And you can add more instructions from different threads to increase resource utilization and thereby hide the latency. But initial motivation was actually to tolerate latency. At least it was, that's how uh, it was proposed. But these are all sides of the same coin, I agree. Uh, you have latency of memory operations, dependent instructions, and branch resolution. And you can hide this latency by utilizing processing resources more efficiently. You can improve system throughput uh, by exploiting thread level parallels. Right? And also, again, by improving utilization of the processor. And this is especially specific to simultaneous multi-threading. And there is one more, which is to reduce the context switch penalty. Right. You could argue that that's also the side of the same coin. You're improving throughput. But this is a specific case where you're reducing some penalty that exists in multitasking. Right. If you have multiple thread contexts, you don't need to you don't need to have software loading and unloading those thread context, uh, the limited single thread context. Okay? So the yeah. distinct is transparent to operating system, right? Like software doesn't manage the threads. That's right. If you have hardware multi-threading, the software, software just loads the thread context and hardware decides which one to choose. And we will get to that. Okay. So initial motivation was to tolerate latency. When one thread encounters a long latency operation, the processor can execute a useful operation from another thread. Right. And this was how CDC 6600 peripheral processors were designed. Do you remember CDC 6600? We talked about this briefly, right? This was the Canadian company, Control Data Corporation, that was competing with IBM uh, in the 60s. And they did design some of the most sophisticated uh, out-of-order execution processors before Thomas Lowe's algorithm. Uh, and 6600 was not out of order execution, but 7600 was out of order execution. And they had these tables to manage instructions executing out of order, which was not as elegant as Thomas Lowe's algorithm, by the way. But it was an out of order execution processor. Uh, but in these peripheral processors, the IO, or memory latency, was 10 cycles. And they had 10. I.O. thread contexts to cover this latency. I think, I think their pipeline was 100 nanosecond cycle time. Memory had 1,000 nanosecond latency. I guess from, from here, you can uh, figure out how much memory latency improved versus pipeline latency improved <laughs> over 40 years. 
this did not change a whole lot. Maybe you can think of it as 100 nanoseconds today. Whereas this went down to, I don't know, 0.2 nanoseconds. <laughs> okay, but uh, going back to the idea, each I.O. processor can execute one instruction every 10 cycles on the same pipeline. So you have a 10 stage pipeline. Each I.O. thread or processor can input an instruction every 10 cycles. This way, if you have 10 of these threads, you could utilize this pipeline fully and you can tolerate the latency of one I.O. operation. Right? With, uh, oper with I.O. operations from nine other threads. Make sense? And if you would like to learn more, this is a great book, uh, Design of a Computer, the Control Data 6600. The terminology is old. Uh, it's written by the uh, system architect, James Thornton. And uh, it is available online, and Han will put a link to it probably, or maybe you can, you can even copy the book because it is made available uh, after Thornton died by his wife. Uh, and I'd encourage you to read it. It's tough reading though. <laughs> It's old, very old terminology. This is a shorter version of it, an earlier version also, uh, that talks about the parallel operation. It does talk about the peripheral processors. It does go into a lot of great detail as to how the system operates, including the microarchitecture, system software, and a lot of other things. Okay, so that's the first example of multi-threading. It was designed in early 1960s. Mm. What is the benefit of it? Well, latency tolerance we discussed, better hardware utilization. But there's a question here, right? You don't always get better hardware utilization. There's a condition. What is that condition? That's right. You need to have enough threads. If you don't have threads, then you're supplying one instruction every 10 cycles in this pipeline, and you're getting your throughput to be low as before. Oh, well, you get reduced context switch penalty too. But this comes at a cost. I guess what is the cost? Let's talk about that. Nothing is free. Yes. That's right. You need extra registers, right? You need to have the hardware context in there, and that requires registers. That's one. And that comes with its associated costs. What else? Yes. That's right, yes. I didn't include it, but you could include that over here. That's, but that's right. And that, that's, that switching policy will be very important, as we will see. What else? Yes? Caching of uh, cache lanes or shared, shared resources. That's right. Contention. Well, this is one of the reasons, right? Usually reduce single thread performance because of resource sharing and contention. And also, if you have fine-grained multi-threading, you have reduced single-thread performance, right? Because we are feeding instructions every n cycles into the pipeline from a single thread. What else? There must be another cost. I guess there's also switching penalty, right? It may not be, uh, if you have fine-grained multi-threading, maybe your switching penalty is not very high. But if you have coarse-grained multi-threading, you will have some switching penalty. And we will discuss that. Okay, any other costs? There may be, this is not an exhaustive list. Okay, so types of multi-threading, uh, we've talked about fine-grained. This is also called cycle by cycle, and we'll cover that. This is, these processors have the ability to switch to a different thread every, other, uh, every cycle. Coarse-grained multi-threading, this is also called switch on event. For example, when a thread gets a cache miss, you switch to another thread. Or you can switch to another thread when a quantum expires, when a timeout happens. Right. And there's also simultaneous multi-threading, where you can uh, execute instructions concurrently from multiple threads at the same time. Now, what does this require? Because this requires that you have multiple functional units, right? These two do not require that you have multiple functional units. Okay? So yeah. How is this one different from super scalar when you have multiple contexts as well as multiple execution units? Wouldn't it? Multiple contexts as well as multiple execution units. So 
Well, if you have, if you're, if you can actually execute from multiple threads at the same time, that's right. That's that's a simultaneous multi-threading engine. Yeah. So, uh, wouldn't it, uh, so is it different from a superscalar processor? So a superscalar processor has the ability to fetch, decode, execute multiple instructions in parallel, right? You need to have the sub that substrate or something similar to that substrate to be able to do mul simultaneous multi-threading. Okay? So at least the superscalar part and the execution units. Okay. But superscalar processor doesn't mean that it's a multi-threaded processor. So there is a difference. You need to have the part of the superscalar execution substrate for simultaneous multi-threading. But a superscalar processor doesn't automatically have simultaneous multi-threading. You can have single thread that's execu ex executed on a superscalar processor. Okay, so fine-grained multi-threading, uh, the idea is to switch to another thread every cycle such that no two instructions from the same thread are in the pipeline concurrently. This may be a little bit strong uh, in the pipeline uh, or are in the first end stages of the pipeline concurrently. You can think of it that way too. Okay. This improves pipeline utilization by taking advantage of multiple threads. Another way of looking at it is you tolerate the control and data dependencies, the latencies of those in a single thread by overlapping the latency with useful work from other threads. Let's say, let's say you get to a branch on thread, thread A. You don't need to predict that branch, right? You're not going to, uh, ex you're not going to fetch another instruction from that thread until that branch is resolved. but you're gonna fill the pipeline with hopefully useful work from other instructions. Right? You're tolerating that branch resolution latency. When you get to a data dependency, you don't need to stall. You can fetch, you can keep going because another, you're not gonna fetch the dependent instruction until the instruction that produces the value will be executed. Right? Until that is executed, the, pre, the dependent instruction will not be in the pipeline. Okay, so you're, you're tolerating that data dependency latency. That's another way of looking at it. Again, this is the same, uh, two sides of the same coin, right? You improve utilization, but you also tolerate latency. And that's the idea in Thornton's paper. Uh, Burton Smith's paper, actually, this is, uh, this is uh, the paper that had more effect in the end because they designed processors uh, that were heavily multi-threaded, much more heavily multi-threaded than uh, CDC 6600 was. Yes, what I described with CDC 6600's peripheral processing unit is essentially fine-grained multi-threading. The processor executes a different I.O. thread every cycle, right? And an operation from the same thread is executed every 10 cycles. That's fine-grained multi-threading. Then Alcor HEP, uh, the paper you read, uh, had, this is the 50, where the number 50 is coming from that Ben suggested, right? He's, he's too busy looking at his computer, so <laughs> he cannot remember 50. But it actually had 120 threads per processor. It had 50 user and 70 OS threads. And we'll get back to why 120 maybe. And it had some cues to buffer these threads. So these threads could be in multiple states, yes. Previous slide, this slide? Well, if you're strictly fine-grained multi-threaded, then that's not fine-grained multi-threading. You, like you would just waste cycles. Okay. And in fact, these processors wasted cycles. If you, 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 you can have thread context for 120 threads, but let's say you have only two threads or one thread. Let's take the one extreme. You have only one thread. You fetch every eight cycle, every eighth cycle from that thread. We'll get to it. Why every eight? Uh, well, if, if it's five stages, every, every five but it was every eight in then Alcor HEP so because it had an eight stage pipeline. Very bad single thread performance Exactly, yeah. So to be able to get high performance, you do need that many threads. Single thread, uh, the trade-off is single thread performance, we're gonna give up. 
Well, if you, have, you could do that if you have dependency checking logic. If you don't have dependency check logic, if you don't have branch prediction logic, then, right. okay. then you'll get wrong results if you do that, right? And you would need to add a lot of added complexity, so you know you're going to have a lot of threads. Exactly, yeah, that's the trade-off. If you know that your workload has lots of threads, then you can simplify the processor and still get high performance without investing the effort into gaining high single thread performance. Yes? So when you remove the dependency value checker and things like that, you could potentially speed up the clock efficiency? Potentially, yes. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, yeah, and without causing other impacts like power and which comes with the high mm -hmm. efficiency. So it, it won't be always as bad as M by 5 That's right, you can compensate a little bit for frequency, but maybe not, right? That's, that's a harder uh, argument to make. You can design very high frequency processors that have dependency checking logic also. But then time to market may increase also. There are lots of factors, right? That's okay, uh, so there were uh, queues to have these threads, buffer these threads. Some of the threads had available instructions. Some of the threads were waiting because let's say a thread gets a cache miss. Well, they don't have caches. Let's say a thread is waiting for a memory. It's, it, go, it went into this waiting queue. Right? And each thread can only have one instruction in the processor pipeline. And each thread was independent in their case, or assumed to be independent. Basically, to, to each thread, the processor looks like a sequential machine, not even a pipeline machine. Right? Uh, and the trade-off, as we just discussed, was between multi-threaded throughput versus single thread speed. They sacrifice this second part. So this is what it kind of looked like. Uh, they had a, a cycle time of 100 nanoseconds and the pipeline was eight stages and it took 800 nanoseconds to complete an instruction. And if you had only single thread, you would fetch, com you would uh, complete an instruction every 800 nanoseconds, even though your frequency was 100 nanoseconds. That's another way of thinking about it, right? This is assuming no memory access, of course. And threads were queued in two places, uh, at least two places in this case. Basically, if one is to fetch instruction. This is the available queue, the threads that can uh, fetch instruction at that time. And it was FIFO. And this is the queue for threads that are waiting, right? that are waiting for, for data from memory. And uh, once a thread became available, its data became available, it would execute, store its result, and then go back to the available queue to be fetched, to fetch its, uh, to get its next instruction fetched again. Whenever, uh, whenever it becomes the head of the queue. Does that make sense? It's a very simple design, basically. Threads move around between the queues, basically. And they could stall. Stalling happens here. When you try to fetch your operand and you need to go to memory, then uh, you go into the queue, wait for memory, and come back into the available queue when your operand is done. OK, so what are the advantages of this? Well, there's no need for dependency checking between instructions, right? Control or data. No need for branch prediction logic. That covers the control, I guess. And you improve utilization and you improve system throughput. Right. Disadvantages, I think we've already covered. Uh, these are common to any multi-threading. You have additional hardware complexity, you know, multiple hardware contexts and thread selection logic. You get reduced single thread performance. This is especially prevalent in fine-grained multi-threading, right? at least in this form of fine-grained multi-threading. And when, fi when we talk about fine-grained multi-threading, it's always this form. We're going to make it uh, more flexible later, perhaps. The problem is you're fetching one instruction every n cycles. And you still have resource contention. Right? These threads still contend for memory. And you, if the threads have dependencies, you still need to do this, right? You still need to have dependency checking logic between threads, load and store. And threads have dependencies, right? Yes? So, so uh, the, the memory access time was uh, one microsecond, right? 1,000 nanoseconds? Was it? I don't remember. Yeah, I think that's what the... Okay. 
So my, my guess is the memory access was actually more, more than 1,000 nanoseconds because what, that 1,000 nanoseconds was for CDC 6600. Yeah, but that doesn't matter. Yeah. That doesn't matter because it was actually more yeah. in, uh, in he, than Alcor or HEP. Maybe, I, I thought you, you remembered from the paper. <laughs> so I was happy for a while. <laughs> and then I became unhappy again. <laughs> but that's okay. <laughs> no, so what you say is fine. Uh, memory access time is much longer than the pipeline uh, time. Which means that, that that's exactly why you have more threads than, uh, so, okay, let's say you had no memory access. You just need eight threads, right, to cover the pipeline latency because you have eight stages. Yep. But they had 120 threads. Why? Because your memory access was much longer, right? And these queues can house basically 120 threads. That's what the queues are for. The thread goes to a queue, wait for memory, and then at some point comes back. If there's nothing in this queue, you're not fetching anything, right? That's the idea. Everybody is waiting for, everybody hopefully is in that queue if they're, they're not in this queue or executing. Okay? Oh, thanks. Okay, good. Okay. Yeah, think about this. Dependency checking logic between threads still remains. Right. You need to have something like this if you're doing loads and stores. And these processors handle this uh, by synchronization, synchronizing at memory, right? Remember the full empty bits? That's essentially their de dependency checking logic. They were simple, they didn't have caches. They didn't execute multiple instructions per thread. So this was not a, not a big issue here. But this will become an issue when we talk about simultaneous multi-threading especially, when you have many instructions from each thread and you have loads and stores and the threads may be communicating. How do you detect those dependencies? Okay, so one example, uh, well, this is just an example of the multi-thread pipeline. I like the slide. Mm. Basically, this is what it looks like, right? You have multiple program counters. This is a simple five-stage pipeline, I think. Is it five stages? Uh, and four threads. Basically, you need to have multiple register files, multiple program counters, and a thread select logic. It's a simple one because it basically increments the thread that you're gonna select every cycle. This is how you do round robin. Right? And hopefully it's a saturating increment. Hopefully you all remember what a saturating increment is, right? Satur saturating arithmetic. Otherwise you may get numbers that are not necessarily <laughs> uh, encoding the threads that you have. And Sun Niagara, you've seen this before, right? Maybe not exactly this picture, but Sun Niagara is a fine-grained multi-threaded processor. That's what they had. They had this... Uh, PC logic, you have four program counters that fed into a MUX, that fed into the iCache, and then you would have four instruction buffers. It's a little bit more complicated than what we had before. And you had four register files. Right? And this thread select logic was a little bit more complicated. It has to be more complicated, right? You cannot, it cannot just be an increment. Because if, thre if a thread gets a cache miss, you should not fetch from that thread. And that's what this thread select logic was. It took into account instruction type. It took into account whether it had a miss. It took into account whether there was a trap or interrupt. It also took into account resource conflicts. So this is a new example of multi fine-grained multi-threaded engines. There were other fine-grained multi-threaded engines that were uh, built but never, at least so far, haven't seen the day of light. Intel Larrabee, for example, is a fine-grained multi-threaded processor. Okay. One of the biggest ones, perhaps, was the Terra MTA. It's a multi-threaded architecture. Terra later merged with Cray and perhaps remained as the better part of Cray after the, after the merge. Uh, but uh, they had 256, I don't know why, I guess I copied it from somewhere, but 256 threads, let's say. Actually, this was the main, this was the main, uh, this was a bigger system. They had 256 processors. Uh, each had a 21 cycle pipeline and each had 128 active threads. So you can imagine how many threads there are uh, in the system, right? 256 times 128. That's a big number. And a thread could issue instructions every 21 cycles. And single thread performance was terrible. 
well, I guess we already answered this question, right? Then why do you have 128 threads in a processor? Because you have memory. Right? Memory latency in this uh, processor was approximately 150 cycles, so they couldn't even cover the entire latency. Uh, but hopefully, the hope is that not all threads have memory access at the same time, right? If you have some threads that are executing and some threads that are waiting for memory, you could cover uh, the 21 cycle pipeline stage latency. So they didn't have any data cache uh, because in their workloads they found that they were streaming workloads. Uh, that's one of the reasons why this is not a general purpose processor. Uh, and threads can be blocked waiting for memory. If you have more threads, you have better ability to tolerate memory latency. And of course, the cost was you can calculate it, right? 128 times 32 general purpose registers. Their architecture had 32 general purpose registers. And of course, you need to have other architectural registers too. So it's costly. And you can think about uh, switching between the register files, right? Which register file you use. It's a big mux. It's 128 to 1, right? Which register file you <laughs> access. So maybe, maybe it's not that easy to increase the frequency. <laughs> or you, you have a longer pipeline. Okay, so this is the Terra MTA pipeline, which is a nicer picture. So threads could be in multiple pools. These are the queues in HEP. Uh, initially, they start out in the issue pool. These are the threads that are ready to fetch their next instruction. And they move between different pools as an instruction executes. If you have a memory access, you go into the memory pool. And this is the memory pipeline. If you have, I guess, compute and address computation is here, you go to different pipelines. Uh, and if you, let's, this is the interesting part. I guess if you, if you have compute, you write back your result and you go back to, to the issue pool. Right? If this is the memory pipeline, you go into the memory pool and then wait for memory. So there is a, it is possible that you may need to retry. If you read the paper, well, I guess you haven't read the Terra paper. Uh, but you can retry, especially if the memory location you're accessing is not available. Right? And why is it not available? Because it's not full. That's how you synchronize between threads. Let's say this thread uh, does a load from memory location X. It sends a request to the interconnection network, which at some point accesses the memory location. And the memory location comes back with saying this location is empty. Then the thread would go into the retry pool and it would retry. That was how the processor was designed. And if the memory location uh, comes back with full, uh, then the thread would go back into the write pool and write its result into the register file. And then the next instruction, it would go into the issue pool to fetch its next instruction. So you can imagine this as threads moving around in the processor. Of course, more accurately, you, have you don't keep the thread, uh, entire thread, thread context in the pool, right? It's really the thread IDs. So this is really a lightweight state. But you do have a big register file somewhere here sitting <laughs> for 128 threads. OK, this is clear, fine-grained multi-threading. I've been covering this in all my classes, so you should be very familiar with it. <laughs> OK. Next is coarse grain multi-threading. This is different, but the, uh, these are complementary to each other. You can actually have both. Basically, the idea is when a thread is stalled due to some event, switch to a different hardware context. It's also called switch on events or SOE multi-threading. What are the possible stall events? Why would a thread be stalled? I guess you've seen the memory latency, right? You can. Uh, Ca you can have a cache miss, or you, you can, may not even have a cache, right? You can have a synchronization event, load an empty location. You've just seen that, right? And maybe you have a long floating point operation, right? You could consider that a stall. Anything could be a stall. You could, if you, if you blink a little bit, maybe uh, HEP and Terra can be considered as fine-grained multi-threading plus coarse-grained multi-threading, right? Because a thread gets out of the pool uh, if it gets a stall event. Right. But it's really fine-grained multi-threading because 
this mechanism is already there. You know, so it has fine-grained multi-threading and compasses uh, coarse-grained multi-threading if you have enough threads context to switch to, right? Okay. Um, explicit switch on event multi-threading is, uh, at least this was the paper that introduced it. There were other implementations before. Uh, and this April processor, and I would encourage you to read this paper also. I did not require it, but Han will post it. Uh, these are some of the early papers on multi-threading and multi-processing. Uh, the idea was to have four hardware thread contexts in hardware like this. It's the same as, uh, fine, as in fine-grained multi-threading, but you don't switch to another hardware context every cycle. You switch to another hardware context when one hardware context gets a cache miss, does a network access, or gets a synchronization fault. And there are many reasons for synchronization faults that you can read in the paper. Uh, and that's the idea, basically. This is the processor state. You have four frames, program counter and uh, registers. And this is the memory state. Memory, uh, well, this is uh, essentially the software state. You can think of it that way. You have many threads available, but some of them are actually in the hardware contexts. That's kind of the operating systems we write. And coarse grain multi-training says that you switch to another hardware context when you get a cache miss. So how do you switch? Now, now the processor is not designed for multi-threading purely. The processor is still, you can fetch, you have a pipeline, and you, ca you, ha you can have instructions from the same thread at the same time. In fact, your, all of your stages can have instructions from the same thread. Which means that when you decide to switch, you need to empty the processor pipeline, right? You basically flush the pipeline and change the program counter. You just don't need to reload the registers because the registers are already in hardware. Right. So let's take a look at fine-grained versus coarse-grained. What are the advantages of fine-grained over coarse-grained? Any advantages? It's, yeah. I guess that's true, yeah. I don't know if I have it in this long list, but <laughs> uh, multi-threaded throughput is probably better uh, in the fine-grained system because you can tolerate these very fine-grained uh, data dependencies a lot better. Right? But it's simpler to implement also, right? Now you don't need to have uh, dependency checking or branch prediction logic at all in the fine-grained multi-threading processor. Whereas in coarse-grained multi-threading, I guess you could treat it as, uh, I, won't, I won't fetch one instruction. Uh, you could treat it as fine-grained multi-thread, but not fetch from another thread, but that makes no sense, right? Yeah, you still uh, need to implement dependency checking and branch prediction to keep the pipeline full. In fine-grained multi-threading, switching need not have any performance overhead, right? You don't have dead cycles because you've designed your processor to switch between different threads every cycle. Whereas in coarse grain, well, because you don't have more, more than one instruction from a thread in the pipeline, you just switch. Whereas in coarse grain multi-threading, you need to have this pipeline flush overhead. You could optimize it, but that comes at the cost of complexity again. Yeah, that's the complexity part. Somehow you either need to save the pipeline state or do something else. And you get high performance overhead with deep pipelines uh, and large windows. Well, of course, there's an obvious disadvantage of fine-grained multi-threading, which we've been talking about, which is low single-thread performance, right? Coarse-grained multi-threading does not have that. Uh, with fine-grained multi-threading, each thread gets one nth of the bandwidth of the pipeline. Whereas with coarse-grained multi-threading, each thread still can get the full pipeline to itself. And there were real implementations of it, which we will cover. Uh, this was one of the first real implementations, IBM's RS64-4 machine. It was a four-way superscalar in-order five-stage pipeline machine. It had two hardware contexts, and you would switch from one uh, hardware context to another when, the, when one of the hardware contexts got an L2 cache miss. And how did it work? Basically, the processor flushed its pipeline and switched the program counter. Uh, there were a lot of constraints, and you can read that. Uh, I didn't assign a paper because there is no good paper actually on this. 
Uh, you can read the manuals if you want. <laughs> but memory latency versus thread switch overhead is a consideration always, and we'll get back to this. Uh, one, uh, I guess, good thing you could consider here is the pipeline flush overhead it was not that much here because it was an in-order five-stage pipeline machine. So there were only five instructions in the pipeline that you would flush when you were switching between threads. Okay. Intel's Itanium uh, uh, processors, or starting with Montecito, have been coarse-grained multi-threaded. And this is a good paper uh, to read. I haven't required it, but this kind of tells you how coarse-grained multi-threading works pictorially, right? If you have a single thread, you would have, uh, I guess this is A is one thread and B is another thread, right? And when A gets a cache miss, you, it'll be idle, and then A would execute again, it'll be idle for a while, and then A would execute again, and at some point you would switch to B. If you have, uh, if you have a single thread context. And somehow it's assuming that I guess single thread context switch overhead is zero. But that's also magic. <laughs> but here, if you have a coarse grain multi-threading, this is what would happen. You would execute A, it would get a cache miss, and there would be some switch overhead, and then you would execute B, it would get a cache miss, and there would be some switch overhead. You would execute the next portion of A, and the next portion of B, and then you would hide some of the latency. That's the idea. And this processor is switched on uh, L3 cache misses. When one, one, one thread got an L3 cache miss, it would switch to another thread. And when the data returned, it would switch back to that thread. Uh, there were also, uh, for fairness, there were also timeouts, uh, which we may get to. Looks like this phone is ringing. <laughs> if anybody knows the DJ Robinson, that's your phone. <laughs> uh, so there were timeouts. Uh, if, if a thread was executing too long, for example, it would be hogging the pipeline resources, so that timeout would come into, uh, the timer would expire and uh, enforce a thread switch to another thread, to the other thread. Uh, the software could also initiate a switch using a switch hint instruction. When one of the threads execute a switch hint, that thread would yield the hardware context to the other thread. And you could imagine why this could happen, right? You could, for example, if you're spinning on a lock, you may want to insert a switch hint instruction there such that you, you don't keep executing that spin lock, which is useless, which could be useless, where, when some other thread is doing useful work. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, this, I guess we did not cover it in the last 740, but if we had covered it, Itanium has interesting features like speculative loads. You would, uh, the compiler could uh, do a load much earlier than it would. So it would move, it could move a load before a store without knowing the store address would overlap with this load address. And they called it the speculative loads. Maybe next to 40, you take it, <laughs> if you take, we would cover it. So you have this load in the original code, you have the store, and this ad stores to X, the store, this loads from Y. The compiler has no idea whether this Y overlaps with X, but to optimize code, uh, it would really like to move it up. And maybe most of the time it doesn't overlap, and sometimes it does. Right? The problem is that sometimes it does, the program executes incorrectly if you move this load up. So what they had was a load dot s that would do the load. This is a speculative load. And this load would be replaced by a load dot check. This is essentially doing uh, out of order execution in software. Right. So this load s, when it executed, it would have an entry uh, allocate an entry in what they called it, called adv advanced load address table. You could think of this as the load store buffer in an out of order processor, except this is not an out of order processor. Uh, and this advanced load address table would mark, I assume the program counter was involved, uh, and the address 
that this load actually loaded from. And this later store would uh, also mark the advanced load address table. And when this load check instruction executed, it would check if the store actually marked the same address. That's the idea. And uh, the interesting thing was uh, when we would get an invalidation, you need to flush the pipeline. Well, in this case, they did not flush the pipeline. Uh, they would switch to another thread. Make sense? I guess they would still flush the pipeline to switch to another thread. But this was one of the cases where they would switch to another thread. These are good things to know. It's, this is one way of actually approximating the benefits of out of order execution in software. Right? You have an in order processor, but you want to move the load up. How do you move the load up? Well, you have a speculative load and you have a software controlled memory disambiguation logic or load store buffer with hardware support, of course. OK. Uh, and of course, uh, well, not of course, but the paper talks about how to switch to another thread when you transition to low power mode. And they report less than 2% area overhead due to coarse grain multi-threading in their results. I guess we will kind of compare it, compare it to uh, simultaneous multi-threading. Intel simultaneous multi-threading papers reported around 5% area overhead for their simultaneous multi-threading support. Yes? That's right. Some processors actually had that. Some processors had the uh, locked cache bit. But in this case, when the data returned, they would switch back. So they wouldn't have that problem. But the, you could have a race condition. That's right. You could have a race condition where when you bring it, some, some prefetch, for example, can uh, get rid of that cache line while you're switching to the other thread. So you can, you can have those they mechanisms. That's right. Okay. But you don't necessarily, that may not be a good policy also, as we will see. When the data returns, you may not want to necessarily switch back to the thread, right? Because that has high overhead. Why? Because you've executed the thread for a short time. Maybe you warmed up the cache. Now you're switching back. Right? So it's not clear what the best policies are in coarse grain multi-threading. And this is one of the reasons many companies did not go this route. OK, I guess I'll cover the slide and then we can depart uh, because this will make you think, hopefully. Uh, so one, uh, there are issues in coarse grain multi-threading. And one issue is fairness. Right? This is more of an issue in coarse grain multi-threading than fine grain multi-threading. Because all threads make progress, as uh, you mentioned, uh, in fine grain multi-threading. Right? Whereas here, it's not clear whether all, all threads will make progress. Uh, Fairness is, I guess, loosely can be defined as how much progress each thread makes. And in coarse grain multi-threading, the time you allocate to each thread affects both fairness and system throughput. And I'll leave you with some questions. When do you switch from one thread to the other? Is it on a cache miss? Is it on a timeout? Is it on a, for a combination of both? Is there something else? And for how long do you switch? How long do you stay in this mode? Another way of asking this is, when do you switch back? Yes. How does the hardware scheduler interact with the software scheduler for fairness? Right. Hardware is executing some threads. The software is basically providing some threads to the hardware. And software has some assumptions, perhaps, saying that I'm providing these four threads, and I'm going to assume that these threads make progress. Underneath, hardware is doing the scheduling. Maybe one thread is not making progress at all. So software has some assumptions. Hardware may be breaking those assumptions. What is the switching overhead versus what is the benefit you gain from switching? And this also depends on where do you store the context, right? Do you prefetch the context into the machine uh, when you switch? Or what happens when you run out of thread contexts? Right. Well, these are all interesting questions uh, to think about in coarse grain multi-threading. And some, I know some companies 
uh, did not answer, could not answer good, uh, these questions positively. That's why they decided not to implement coarse grain multi-threading because it was not clear that they would gain from coarse grain multi-threading. Instead, they could, waiting was a better answer in a single thread because there was, there's overhead associated with it. Okay, I guess I'll leave you uh, with this and we'll continue multi-threading in the next lecture.